This video will serve as an introduction to Unit 8, which is all about the different states of matter. Uh, we'll be talking today about solids, liquids, and gases primarily, but we'll also touch on the fourth state of matter, the mysterious one, uh, plasmas. Let's run down a list of the learning objectives for this video. We'll start our discussion by talking about the states of matter themselves. Uh, this will largely be a review from past years. We'll talk about the basic and characteristics of our three different states, uh, as well as a comparison of the characteristics at the atomic level that makes one state different from another. One of these states that we will talk about a little bit today, but we will not discuss a lot afterwards, is the fourth state of matter. It's the most common state of matter in the universe, but it's one of the most uncommon states of matter we have on our planets, and that's the state of matter called plasmas. We'll start a brief introduction into the idea of intra- and intermolecular forces and what those terms mean, which we'll talk a lot more about later on in the chapter. And last but not least, we'll talk about state changes. Turns out... There are six ways to change between our three states of matter. Most people are familiar with two of them. Uh, we'll talk about all six. And then last but not least, we can plot those changes in something called a phase diagram. Just as a quick introduction into what we're talking about with state changes and actual states of matter, uh, we can start with this substance here. Uh, this is the element mercury, which is one of the few metals that is liquid at room temperature. But just like all elements on the periodic table, the application or removal of heat can cause mercury to change into the other states. Uh, for example, taking the same mercury and cooling it uh, in a bath of liquid nitrogen will drop it below its melting point and cause the mercury to solidify. And just like any other metal, it can be cast into unique shapes with a lot of detail. Allowing that fish then to warm back up to room temperature will eventually cause it to start melting again and liquefy to eventually turn back into the puddle of liquid mercury. All metals are work within the same way. It just happens that most of them don't do these kind of things at room temperature. So let's begin then with a rundown of the states of matter that you guys are going to be responsible for. The first state of matter we'll talk about here uh, is a state of matter that we see a lot of, and that is the state solids, a state of matter that is typically found at lower temperatures, and they're characterized, so we got lower temperatures here, and solids are characterized by having fixed shaped and fixed volumes. And over here we have a sample of a solid that occurs naturally. Uh, this is what happens when bismuth metal solidifies under very specific conditions. Uh, it creates these very unique and very colorful crystals. The second state of matter we're interested in here would be the state liquid. Uh, this is a state of matter typically found at intermediate temperatures with a fixed volume but it adopts the shape of its container, meaning it has no definite shape like solids do. This here is a sample of the element bromine, which is one of the few elements like mercury that's liquid at room temperature. Next on our list is uh, the third state of matter, and that is the state of gas. Uh, gases are typically found at higher temperatures, and they have shapes and volumes that are determined by their container. No definite shape, no definite volume. Uh, this stuff in this container here, this very characteristic green color, uh, is characteristic of the element chlorine, which is a gas at room temperature. Actually used as one of the first types of chemical weapons uh, in early warfare. Last but not least, and probably the most mysterious of the group, is the state plasma. A state of matter is typically found at very high temperatures. And what happens is, at these very high temperatures, is the electrons separate from the actual atoms, and you end up getting this sea of naked nuclei. So you've got all these nuclei floating around, and there's this big pool of electrons that they all share. Uh, plasmas are characteristic uh, for giving off light, just like the plasma here in this image. Uh, and despite something being mysterious, we actually see these very commonly in things like flames and light bulbs. The light being given off is caused by matter being in the plasma state. Really quickly, to kind of summarize some of the things we said on the previous slides here, we can do a comparison of the three different types of uh, states that we're interested in. Uh, we can see, for example, that there's a lot of similarities and differences between the two of those, and that's going to be something that will kind of govern how we approach material in this chapter. For example, you can notice that in both solids and liquids, we see uh, closely packed molecules. We see in both cases relatively slower movement, However, we don't see the similarities here. The one thing that separates a solid from a liquid is the degree of organization. In a solid, the atoms organize themselves in regular patterns. In liquids, those patterns do not. We also see a relatively similar degree of forces holding solids and liquids together. As a result of this, I would draw a separating line here in this table and talk about how solids and liquids, 
from a standpoint of properties are very similar to one another, whereas our third state of mass, or state of matter, gases, are very different. Uh, gases have very large spaces separating them, which makes them very different than the other substances. Very high velocities, whereas solids and liquids tend to move much slower. No pattern or organization and no forces holding it together. Because of this, we'll talk about gases in this chapter as a separate entity, and we'll talk about solids and liquids together. To provide you a little more details about how plasmas work, uh, plasmas are created, or ignited is actually the term we talk about with plasmas. Uh, they occur when enough energy is added to the gases to ionize the atoms. And what that means is basically to remove the electrons from the atom itself. And that energy is enough to then keep them in this ionized state. Uh, the end result is, is because now we have the nuclei floating around separate from the electrons. This allows electrons to move around very freely, which causes um, plasmas, in most cases, to conduct electricity very, very well. Uh, these things are the most, this state of matter is the most common in the universe. Uh, for example, the sun and all the stars out there are basically giant balls of matter and the plasma state. But we also see plasmas in the form of neon signs. The flame that we see in a fire is actually oxygen and the mixture of gases in our atmosphere in the plasma state. And the light, again, that comes out of a fluorescent light bulb is in the plasma state. If you recall, electricity travels through the length of the tube. The tube gives off light that is characteristic of the elements inside, but that's because those elements are now in the state of a plasma. And you've actually seen this in a more literal way uh, whenever you played with one of these. This is what's known as a plasma ball. There is a very high electrical potential between the ball in the middle and the outer surface. And as a result, as electricity jumps from the inside of the ball to the outside of the ball, it causes, it leaves a trail basically in the gases in the ball itself that cause these to turn into briefly the plasma state, and then they give off light as a result of that. By introducing different gases into the ball, you can get different colors uh, that these plasma balls can actually be. So let's move on to the, uh, the next phase here. When we're dealing with solids and liquids in particular, we're very interested in the forces acting inside of these molecules. Um, so molecular forces come in two major varieties. Uh, we'll talk about intramolecular forces. Uh, and if you think about the word intra in the form of like intra-office mail, that's mail with inside the office, which means these are forces that are acting between atoms within a single compound. Uh, these forces are forces we've already talked about this year. Ionic bonds are a form of intramolecular force. Covalent bonds are a form of intramolecular force. And in larger molecules, we can actually get forces between atoms that aren't even bonded together, and those can fall under this category as well. To contrast intramolecular forces, we have intermolecular forces. Interoffice mail is mail that's sent from one office to another between offices. And that's exactly what intermolecular forces are, is they are forces acting between molecules in a sample. So one water molecule being attracted to the next water molecule would be an example of an intermolecular forces. And these forces are typically electromagnetic, meaning we're dealing with positive and negative charges. So to continue our discussion on intermolecular forces, and let's be clear, we're still talking about intermolecular forces, uh, these intermolecular forces are stronger when the molecules themselves are close together. Uh, this occurs primarily when we're dealing with solids and liquids, and we see very little intermolecular forces in the form of gases. And again, this is one of the big reasons why we treat these two particular topics so separately. It's the difference in those intermolecular forces that makes them so much different from one another. The strength can also be determined by the characteristics of the molecules themselves. The size of the molecule, and probably more importantly, the polarity of the molecule, all determine how strong those intermolecular forces can be. When you have more and stronger intermolecular forces, this again affects the behavior of the compound itself. The compound that has more intermolecular forces is more likely to be a solid at room temperature. And these compounds typically are more difficult to melt and boil because melting and boiling is really talking about separating molecules from one another. Going from the solid and liquid state and transferring into the gaseous state means going from lots of intermolecular forces to very little. The stronger those intermolecular forces are, the more difficult melting and boiling ends up being. 
All of these topics are things that we'll discuss a lot more later in the chapter when we focus specifically on solids and liquids. So for the last part of our video then, we'll talk about the idea of state changes. Basically a state change is when the conditions of a sample are changed, causing it to change from one state to another. For example, we can think of melting as going from solid ultimately to the liquid state. And that would be a state change. Then these state changes are dependent on two things. First of all, and more obviously of the two, temperature. As we increase temperature from high to low, we can expect things to go from solid to liquid to gas or vice versa. Less obvious is that state changes are also dependent on pressure. Uh, you probably at home have a tank of um, liquid natural gas, which you might use in a grill. The thing that keeps the gas at a liquid is the fact that it's highly pressurized in the tank or a propane cylinder as well. When you release the pressure and the gas comes out of the tank, it immediately turns back into a gas again uh, because that pressure has been released. Now it turns out that there are six possible state changes. Most people are familiar with two of them. Boiling and melting represent two that we know. There are four others and we need to make sure that we identify all six possible changes. To help identify those changes, oh, we're going to be talking about something here known as a phase diagram. And what a phase diagram does is it plots temperature versus pressure, and it shows you at what temperature and pressure combinations your substance is at what state. For example, at one atmosphere of pressure and about a hundred, and at about, like, say, for example, 50 degrees Celsius, we see that liquid uh, H2O is in the liquid state, or what we would call water. What I want to use this chart for now is to identify phase change, or identify the phase changes themselves. We'll talk more about what a phase diagram is in a moment. So let's start with some of the phase changes that we are more familiar with. Uh, when ice turns into water, we call that melting. And when water turns back into ice, we call that freezing, things that we're very familiar with. Um, when water is heated past its boiling point and turns into water vapor or gas, we call that boiling. But when we go in the reverse direction, we take water vapor and turn it back into liquid water, we call that condensing. Uh, and we can see condensation, for example, on a cold glass on a warm winter day. That's where water from the atmosphere is condensing on the surface of the glass. The state changes we're less familiar with, because these typically do not happen under normal conditions, is when we go directly from uh, ice to the gas state. Uh, when ice goes directly from solid to a gas, we call that sublimation. And when a gas turns directly back into a solid again, as opposed to going in the liquid state, uh, we call that deposition. So from this picture, you should be able to describe what these six possible state changes are to go between all three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. So now that we've identified the six possible state changes that we have saw before, let's talk about the actual diagram itself, something known as a phase diagram. And what a phase diagram is, is a plot of temperature versus pressure to show what state your substance is in under any set of conditions. Normally, this is something that's not super important for us because our atmosphere always provides us with the same pressure, one atmosphere of pressure. Under different pressure conditions, however, which can happen in the lab, we see things like boiling point and melting point change, and this phase diagram is what shows us that. And really what we get out of this, and this is something, again, I think that's not obvious for a lot of people, is that state changes are dependent on both temperature and pressure. And as I've already said, we don't see the pressure changes all that much. We see the temperature changes, but both of these are key to understanding your substance. We'll take a look at a phase diagram in a moment, but I do want to identify some key uh, components of it. Uh, when both pressure and temperature uh, point you've got is on the actual line of a phase diagram where the state changes occur, you get a really interesting condition where both states are actually present. And we saw this earlier in the year. As an ice cube is melting, we have both the liquid and the solid state present simultaneously. And as a result of that, we actually stay on that line until the transition completes occurring. And we saw that in the form of heating curves, that had these flat spots in them that showed temperature stay the same. So we get both states occurring simultaneously. So if you can be on a line 
there's also the opportunity of being at the intersection of all the lines on the graph, and this is a special point known as the triple point of the substance. That triple point is when you have all three states present simultaneously. You have the solid water, the liquid water, and the gaseous water above it, and all six state changes are occurring simultaneously. There's this constant shuffling back and forth uh, between all three of the different states. This is a very difficult situation to create in a lot of things. It doesn't occur naturally very often, uh, but it can be an interesting thing to observe uh, if you're actually able to recreate those conditions. So let's take a look at a specific example of a phase diagram. Uh, the previous phase diagram we saw was for water. This is a phase diagram for the substance carbon dioxide. And again, we can see the different lines. We've got the solid phase, the liquid phase, and the gaseous phase here, all highlighted in different colors. Uh, we can see the lines that represent the boundary between the two of those. And we can see that at one atmosphere of pressure, the transition, uh, which is the temperature we're normally here where for carbon dioxide, doesn't cross the liquid solid line, it crosses the liquid gas line. This is why we refer to CO2 in the solid state as dry ice, because when it melts at one atmosphere of pressure, our atmosphere, it goes directly from the solid to a gas. Liquid water at one atmosphere has a line that's further up here, and as a result, it's transitioned from a solid to a liquid, which is something we're more, we're more um, familiar to see. Uh, and as you can see here, as the pressure changes in all these scenarios, we see different temperatures at which all of these state changes occur. At 72 atmospheres, which is about 72 times the pressure we currently experience, we see that carbon dioxide uh, boils at 31 degrees Celsius. But down at five point, or down like maybe like at 10 atmospheres, which is right around here-ish, we see that it boils at a significantly lower temperature, probably somewhere in the negative 20 degrees Celsius range. Uh, and again. The graph is a way of kind of identifying with a pressure and a temperature what the different states will be in. So that's pretty much it for this video. Uh, at this stage in the game, you should be able to define what the four states of matter are, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. You should be able to compare them property-wise as well as what's going on at the atomic level, how they move and behave differently. Uh, you should be able to identify or define the terms intra- and intermolecular forces. And last but not least, be able to briefly describe what a phase diagram is, uh, knowing all six of the possible phase changes uh, and discuss the actual plot itself. I should hypothetically be able to give you pressures and temperatures, and you should be able to tell me what phase or what state of matter your substance would actually be in.